morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Manish Kumar, uh, Senior Vice President for Digital Buildings at Schneider Electric. Welcome to Innovation Talk Let's Exchange series. Uh, we are living through unprecedented times of COVID-19. There are more and more increasing demand from us as human beings, as people, whether it's juggling many schedules, many priorities, or even taking care of our kids, helping them in school work today. Our buildings are no different. We are seeing increasing demand from buildings, whether it's about much more scrutiny on HVAC system for better air quality, whether it's a touchless solutions or implementing safe distancing, increasing demand from buildings. I also wanna highlight that while we are facing this pandemic, we are also seeing another big area of climate change which is need for sustainable buildings. Now, all of us spend a lot of time in buildings during our lifetimes, whether it's going to work, whether it's living, whether for vacation, whether it's uh, uh, you know, care as a hospital, et cetera. In fact, we spend 90% of our time, our lifetime in buildings. That's why it's very, very important for us that buildings are occupant centric. They provide a safe and healthy environment to all of us. As I was saying earlier, at the same time, climate change is also a big priority and buildings need to take care of well-being of our environment as well and provide sustainable building. Also, a lot of economic activity happens in building. Building needs to provide us a safe shelter to work. It needs to provide us resilient infrastructure. We are together for next one hour to talk through and discuss challenges of building, the increasing demands from building, and how we can make our building safe, healthy. We can bring back the occupants back to building, but at the same time, create sustainable and resilient buildings. Today, I'd like to welcome our panel of experts who will be sharing their tips, best practices on this topic. I have Mike Hughes, who is Zone President, UK and Ireland at Schneider Electric. Kelly Beckham, who is principal uh, at ACOM, leading workplace strategy. And I have Stuart Davis, who is uh, London's zone president for Kendra Energy Solution. Everyone, welcome to the panel discussion. Uh, and for our viewers who are on the chat, uh, I like to offer you that you ask the questions on the chat. We have a subject matter experts who are ready to answer your questions on this very important topic. Mike, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Uh, you are based in London. Uh, what are you seeing? Uh, the current challenges that are increasing demand from the buildings. Yes, and I'm specifically. I'm, hi, Mike. And these challenges probably are getting amplified uh, by the ongoing pandemic and increasing needs. What are you seeing? Yes, absolutely. And first of all, delighted to be here. Uh, I think we are in a very interesting time for buildings because, of course, buildings are major assets for companies. And the, the pandemic situation has obviously changed their importance, their position uh, quite a lot. So I'm, I'm sitting here in London. My office is in Victoria in London. And what we clearly see is a lower use of buildings, a lower occupancy rate of buildings as we go through this pandemic. And London, interestingly, in particular, because it's a very strong commuter town, has been uh, slower to recover than most towns and cities. Uh, so footfall in London was down 75%, uh, and it's down more than 40% compared to other major cities. And of course, this creates a major challenge for the owners of buildings, is how to encourage people to come back and use the offices. And what's quite interesting is when you when you do a little bit of surveys around this and you ask your your teams, it's not actually so much the buildings. Uh, people believe that we are capable to manage the buildings and to use technology to manage the buildings. It's actually more reluctance to get on transport and to come back. So th this is one of the big challenges that we we face at the moment. So occupancy rates are lower. That causes challenges around uh, rentability, etc. And I think what's very important in this time is, the, is that people have started to understand that buildings are major assets. They need to be used well. 
with lower occupancy, you need to be smart about how you manage buildings because you don't want to have lower occupancy but full cost. And you really need to remember that a building, people need to want to come there. And it's, it's a projection of your brand. And people nowadays, of course, want to be involved with sustainable buildings and work with companies that feel they're doing their bit for the environmental challenge. So so very interesting time for buildings, uh, Manish. And um, I, I think we have a number of challenges ahead and very looking forward to the discussion today about how technology uh, can help us in that. Mike, uh, you said all, uh, multiple challenges and how technology can help us solve some of the challenges. I'm going to uh, uh, shift to uh, Kelly. Kelly, you work at ACOM, one of the leaders in designing transformative buildings around the world. Uh, now, uh, we are reacting to some of these challenges and these problems and trying to solve but I also feel that there is a need to proactively for us to be able to create much more healthier, safe, and resilient, and sustainable building. Uh, how do you see the evolution, and how are you uh, at ACOM, uh, uh, you know, tackling these uh, projects? Sure. Th thank you. That's a that's an excellent opening question, and and also like Michael, I I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all and and share some of our thoughts and our our efforts around all of this. I, I want to emphasize the element in your question, Manish, in terms of um, how do we go from reactive um, to proactive in the built environment. And um, currently, in today's conditions, obviously, stakeholders, um, building managers, landlords, owners are, are being asked to re-examine the expectations um, of their building, the performance of their buildings. And, and quite frankly, the expectations have drastically shifted over the past six months and will continue to shift over the next six, 12, et cetera. And I, I do want to point out that I'm throughout the next hour as we talk about kind of the immediate, um, I'm also going to distinguish between the immediate as well as the longer term and recognizing there's absolutely a cause and effect, but our um, mentality, our expectations, the demand for buildings, again, is different now than it was six months or so ago. And it will be different and it will continue to evolve over the next um, upcoming months, even years. But going back to, um, so, so the expectations in the current state are, uh, of course, they're, they're simply different. There's been a, a, an, an enormous emphasis on life safety, health and well-being. Now, that's a, a topic that those of us in the real estate design construction industry have always been focused on in terms of healthy buildings and what makes up a healthy building. But really what in many cases the pandemic has done has really uh, daylighted or amplified the importance that the built environment has on overall occupier well-being. Now to use the term well-being is, is to um, really undermine the importance of the current pandemic situation and in terms of you know, the immediate kind of tactical that building operators are having to look at and, and businesses are having to navigate in terms of um, occupancy and utilization and you know as as Michael said in, the, in his commentary that we're seeing that most buildings are only 5 10 15 percent occupied right now depending on your geography depending on the building regulations um, ideally as we move forward that is obviously going to in, in increase as people feel more comfortable in a vaccine scenario and a non-vaccine scenario etc but right now kind of coming back to the idea of technology those buildings that have the occupancy systems, the utilization systems in place are better able to manage this immediate critical element in terms of how many people are in your offices, how many people are in the shared areas, have you exceeded the capacity? You know, that technology has often, um, well, the technology exists. It's a matter of whether or not organizations, buildings, et cetera, have leveraged it. Um, prior to the pandemic, they were much more prepared um, but how can they leverage that technology moving forward? And as we get further along in the talk, there will, um, you know, we'll talk more about the specifics of the technology, but really the opportunity I believe exists to connect all these disparate sensor data streams. You know, there's some that focus on occupancy, there are some that focus on circulation, and there are some that absolutely connect to the ambient environmental conditions that have a direct impact on occupier well-being and occupier health. And so, um, again, the current pandemic scenario has highlighted, has changed the demand 
um, and the ability and the opportunity to make real-time information available to occupiers is only going to help with that confidence as people um, become more comfortable as they overcome the challenges that Michael just shared about um, public transportation. And once they, you know, come up with varied scenarios to have that comfort level of getting there, once they're there, having a, an interactive um, experience with the building will help us collectively navigate being, being inside again. And, and that 90% of the time we spend indoors um, is absolutely on a trajectory to have it be a more interactive experience so that we understand what's happening in and around us. Uh, you brought to a very good point. If I if I just uh, you know pick up those you said, a uh, you know pandemic has amplified the opportunity for us to actually proactively buildings uh, make more healthier and safer uh, you know for occupants. But you also said there is a true opportunity with technology because there is a lots of system, lots of sensor, and people who are using that they are in a better position. Uh, to return back to normal or implement some of the solution or some of the needs. So that's a that's something we will uh, pick up again. So I would just want to highlight that. Uh, may, maybe uh, Stuart, uh, uh, coming to you, you are based in London. Uh, uh, you know, what's the situation in the UK? You know, if you can, uh, you know, uh, educate us and also how your clients or local companies are adjusting to keep occupants safe and healthy. What do you see in UK? Oh, hi, Manish. Well, thank you for the question and uh, thank you for the opportunity and the inviting me here today. Um, well, it seems that recent surveys seem to concur with what we're seeing as a business in London and that um, a fifth or less of employees are actually back in the office and that the majority of staff will not go be going back until um, January 2021. Um, a few firms, including Facebook, have already announced that they have no plans for the return of employees to the office until July 2021. So the companies that are offering employees choice and flexibility, those who want to return to the office. Um, however, employees have their own anxieties with 39% of workers concerned about their ability to social distance from their colleagues in the workplace. While some businesses that have adapted remote working aren't seeing a drop off on productivity since the rise of the COVID crisis, um, almost three quarters, however, are concerned about the long term effects working in isolation could have on their employees, saying maintaining employee morale has been a challenge and difficulties they are having with company culture. I think what is undeniable is that workplaces need to become smarter and more efficient and flexible to cope for the realities of the new normal. Um, so while London remains to be one of the most expensive prime office spaces in the world, many London employees have warned that they will struggle to accommodate 30 to 40 percent of the staff return to offices at any one time due to the need um, to maintain social distancing. So space efficiencies and cost management are top concerns for many tenants, while they need to attract and retain talent by securing high quality, safe and sustainable offices remains. So safety must be the core of what we do. So the majority of companies have made their own offices COVID secure by implementing SIPSI published COVID-19 ventilation guidance over here in the UK. So with evidence that continues to suggest that in poorly ventilated indoor spaces, airborne aerosols are a possible transmission route. Therefore, the main principle of the ventilation advice is to ventilate spaces at a higher volume flow rates and to avoid circulation wherever possible. In many instances, we've been able to respond quickly and importantly We've not needed to put our engineers in harm's way to implement these changes remotely via the BMS. So really, having a resilient building management system is core to the rising and the challenge through digital connectivity. So digital connectivity is what connects people with building systems, granting unprecedented control over building operations. It's what connects our facility managers with the crucial data your systems generate, allowing you to command and conquer energy waste and downtime. And it's what connects the various buildings themselves under a single coherent system of systems. So having a modern BMS is core to being able to provide remote support of buildings. Older systems, you know, we found when we've tried to make these modifications remotely, 
can struggle with corrupt databases that can fall over when these modifications are being carried out. So it's really essential in this day and age that a modern BMS has IP connectivity all the way down to room control. It's also a massive advantage as this provides faster and more as big networks when connecting remotely. So, you know, I was an engineer in a previous life, but I know from our other engineers that there is nothing more frustrating than waiting two minutes for a graphic page to populate or values of a database uploads timing out. It's just simply not workable or efficient use of time. So uh, moving into the sort of room control environment where, you know, the majority of staff are going to be room controllers um, that can have wireless technologies such as Zigbee and Notion devices allow for workspaces to be quickly adapted and to suit the needs of the repurposed workspace. The added benefit is that you can simply add additional devices such as air quality monitoring as and when needs be. Allowing users to have remote access via an app on their phone to either control their environment or give them peace of mind that the workspace is safe is becoming a must have. Stuart, uh, there is uh, one aspect that I can relate to what you said is, even though we are working from home, but humans are social animals. We need to be able to get back to office at some point in time. And, uh, you know, the, the true spirit is collaboration, working together, brainstorming ideas. I fully agree with that. I, I can't wait to go back in a healthier and safe uh, office space. I think I just want to touch upon, you know, what you also said is, uh, the, the power of technology and capacity to add flexibility to be able to react easily to these uh, new demands. For example, you mentioned able to remotely uh, make settings change, uh, able to add architectures, you know, new sensors and, you know, get more insight. All of those are going to be very, very important when people are selecting technology for their building so that they can prepare uh, for what they know, but they, are, they can also prepare for what they don't know. So they have a flexibility in a building system, such as you said, capacity to add sensor, remotely able to change things uh, and all of that. So that's that's gonna be key uh, with all of our building customers going forward. Uh, Mike, uh, you know, you, you are in London. Uh, uh, can you share some examples that you are seeing with your clients, your customers where you know, they are implementing some, you know, successful best practices, successful solutions to be able to meet some of these expectations, you know, where I need a healthier environment, but at the same time, I should be able to have sustainable buildings. So, uh, and I just want to, you know, give a shout to all the viewers who are on the chat. Please feel free to share the best practices that you are seeing within your regions and your businesses. I think that could be great help to the whole community. Yeah, sure, Manish. So, I mean, obviously what we're seeing um, is across our client base is very varied. Um, but one I will call out in particular is, for example, the airport business and particular Stansted Airport that we have been working with, where, you know, overnight they experience a 90% fall in occupancy rate. And you've got this, this airport that you're running that is obviously very expensive, etc., and really, they were they were able to react very quickly about understanding what they needed to do with the building, where was being occupied, where was not being occupied, and to put in a whole new set of procedures that allowed them to substantially reduce the operating cost. And, you know, Stuart was talking about that. It was all because of remote connectivity. Uh, if you want to have a safe building and, and operate a building effectively, it all starts uh, with having a connected building and a smart and sustainable building. And we see we see more and more this trend now. People are becoming aware of the fact that they need more data about what's happening in the building. It's very difficult to make a decision uh, on what's happening in a building if, if, you know, your only connected point is maybe the electricity meter or the gas meter. That's not going to get you very far in today's world of, you know, trying to understand whether one office is occupied or another office or what's the the oxygen and the uh, different ga gaseous rates in the um, uh, in the building itself. Uh, so as Schneider Electric, we take this topic very seriously and we like to not just work with our customers, but we try to also walk the talk on this. And, you know, this, I think Stuart was starting a little confession session about being an engineer in a past life. I'll have to also... I uh, put my hand up to that one. But, you know, being engineers, we love the geeky, techy stuff. 
Uh, but this is all about technology. And, you know, we, we are all about IoT and building management and software and how you put sensors into a building. But more importantly, how you build that architecture of what it looks like to be able to design a building that can be, for example, net zero. And we do that with our ecostructure architecture today. <clears throat> so as, as a company, we're also highly committed to this. Uh, we've signed up to the RE100, which is the renewable, 100% renewable energy, uh, about how we commit our company to that. We've signed that to be by 2030. And more recently, we've also pulled forward our net zero target by to 2025. Now, a little bit of our pedigree in it, just to show that we like to, you know, experience this for ourselves and know what we're talking about. Our headquarter in Paris, which is uh, called the Hive, um, was opened now probably 10 years ago, was actually the first building in the world to obtain the ISO 50001 standard, which was all around energy efficiency management in buildings. Uh, and we've moved on, obviously, from that to a situation today where we're running 13 net zero buildings across our fleet of buildings globally. And we're very pleased to say we've just opening a, a, a building in, in France, which is the first five story building to be fully energy autonomous and the first to exceed 100 points on the LEED uh, certification. So we've been in this a long time. We're doing this a long time. We like to show by example. And that helps us when we're out talking to our customers because we can discuss with them about ventilation rates. We can discuss with them about using technology to understand which desks are being occupied, which rooms are being occupied, what the temperature level is, and bring that all together on one pane of glass, uh, which makes it very easy to remotely control the building and make those decisions that our customers are trying to make right now. How do I operate a building where I have a low occupancy rate, but I want to give the best service possible to those occupants, but not have all the costs? Mike, uh, those are some very, very interesting uh, questions you raise and, you know, examples that you highlighted. I would say, uh, you know, uh, as French say, drink our own champagne. Uh, and I definitely uh, see our building, the Schneider Electric. We are trying to push the limits of technology. And I happen to be in one of those buildings uh, where every year we have reduced dollar per kilowatt hour, uh, sorry, uh, uh, square foot, uh, you know, kilowatt hour per square feet. Every year we have been cutting down and it has been possible because we have been implementing uh, the, the technology and the insight that are coming out of it. And as you said, bringing those insights to actionable or clear actions. Uh, Kelly, I'm, I'm gonna switch to you. I think you were referring earlier the technology, right? How technology can facilitate and Mike alluded to that as well. Uh, we, we see that there is a disconnect in today's built environment or buildings, you know, there's a lot of data. I think the technology is there, but we are still struggling to not leverage digital te technologies enough to be able to, uh, you know, bring a comfort score for a building or a well-being score, able to, you know, detect some of these things very fast, able to remotely uh, manage and operate these buildings. From where you sit, what do you, how do you see the evolution? of digital adoption or acceleration in buildings? Sure, so, and, and that, that's a great question. And, and I think, you know, I, I wanna go back to the introduction in terms of where I believe we are as an industry and the majority of our building stock, if you will, is, is um, certainly reactive and, and it's, it, there's pockets of that proactivity um, and just the potential to have all of them not just be proactive, but at, at some point, and we'll talk about a bit later, just in terms of not only responsive, but in some cases, the opportunity or potential for it to be intuitive, right? And I, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of steps that we have to take in order to get there. But, you know, some of the, the comments that were made previously is, is you know, our, our industry is very technical and as well as it should be, right? That, um, you know, the the need to understand what goes into a healthy building, what needs to, you know, the, the engineering, the architecture, the digital infrastructure, all of those elements that have to come together. Um, and so, you know, the concept of healthy buildings has typically been a very technical topic, which is and has been the focal point of the AEC community, as well as it should be, because we're the ones that are responsible for implementing, creating the environment um, that is a healthy building. But one of the things I just want to share when we talk about high performance buildings, 
Um, we're talking about both the building systems, the performance of the building itself, but we also talk about the occupier's performance and that tie to a healthy building and individual occupier performance is, is not, um, it's not a loose tie. There's a direct cause and effect in terms of um, the amb ambient and or environmental conditions and human performance. Right. So, you know, I think, again, oftentimes, you know, that these technologies, the sensors, et cetera, are geared towards and rightfully so towards helping the owners, operators, managers understand how their building is performing. But therefore, it's also attached to the building information system. In some cases, the facility system, going back to my previous comment about a lot of disparate systems. I think we have the opportunity to bridge that and bridge that knowledge gap and, and allow that information to be accessible. And I'll, I'll explain. I'll explain further that I think you know it wouldn't be um, the, the kind of average occupier, which is an expert in their um, area of expertise, and it may not be architecture, engineering, or healthy buildings, right? The, they um, you know understand um, intellectually that the level of CO two in the air has a direct impact on, say, my energy level, or that you know temperature. I think is one that is felt and understood, right? That if it's too warm, you start to get a little sluggish, a little tired. Um, so these things are kind of known intellectually, but oftentimes that information is not made readily available um, within your existing um, conditions. And as, as Manish uh, started the, the conversation, I think the EPA's statistic, uh, most recent statistic is we spend 93% of our time indoors. Um, so obviously the impact of the built environment on our overall physiological well-being is critical. And so when you kind of dissect that, again, at the most simplistic, um, there's the ambient conditions of noise and light. And, and light is beyond just glare and or um, whether or not you can see clearly. There's a lot of dimensions to light um, that has an impact on cognitive performance. Then, of course, air is critical. The amount of CO2s, the VOCs, the humidity levels, the temperature, those in aggregate all have an impact on cognitive performance. And when we're talking about a, an era of um, you know, knowledge workers and kind of the purpose of our commercial buildings is really to house those activities, is it's really critical that you have the right mix of those elements. So when we partnered with um, with Schneider in the development of the the WPA system, in the development of these pilots and this methodology, you know where the demand is for the building management systems is to understand utilization levels, understand occupancy, understand how the space is being used, and that's typically for the facilities teams to kind of make informed decisions. Then you have the ambient elements, specifically the airflow which is connected to the building information management system, which also has to do with energy efficiency, et cetera. That's a different data stream that's going to a different place. But where can I, as an occupier, understand how the immediate environment is impacting myself? And so um, I'll, I'll just share one of the anecdotes. As we were, as, as our team was in one of the buildings that was being piloted, we had the, the full suite of environmental sensors, the occupancy, the motion, the pressure, um, but also the noise sensors, the light sensors, the CO2, VOCs, humidity, temperature. The pilot was live for about a month. And it really was a matter of us um, assessing and applying our anecdotal knowledge, our qualitative knowledge of being in the space as we were understanding how the system was working. But there was one particular element, one moment that I think everybody can on this call can resonate with. There was um, just a time where there was a group of us where in, in all other scenarios, it had all the conditions of a, of, a, of a solid meeting, meaning it was a team that got along well, it was a topic that we were all engaged and excited about, self-reported, all of us had gotten the proper amount of sleep and had eaten properly uh, the day before and the day of. But as we spent two hours in this one particular room, the during over the course of time, what started as a very uh, engaging meeting, within a half hour, 40 minutes, um, you know, I had a, a wicked headache, a colleague of mine was, was yawning copiously or, or profusely, you know, but, but more importantly, as we were trying to articulate and bring from our thoughts, the, the words weren't forming, um, you know, we were kind of, you know, what's that thing, you know, no, you look it up. I just said it a few moments ago. I mean, everybody's experienced that at some point or another. And in that moment, what typically would have been otherwise been, let me go get another cup of coffee. Let's all take a break. Let's all, um, you know, maybe kind of rethink this again, ca caffeine up. 
we looked at the comfort score and we were able to see that particular room that we were in was in the red. And it was in the red, both temperature, humidity, and CO2. And that was a direct impact. That was the reason why we were struggling to have the same uh, intellectual and, and mental and emotional energy that we had at the beginning of the meeting. And so with that knowledge, there's, you know, there's systems implications. It's going back to the building owner to what happened in that room. Um, but it's also just a, a, a personal, you know, easy fix in terms of keeping the door open, relocating, using a different room. Because in that case, it was mostly the CO2 that was impacting us. So those are actionable insights. And, you know, granted that there's, you know, some probably some legitimate concerns about making that information as accessible and ubiquitous as every other element. But I believe, um, and, and coming back full circle to what Stuart talked about, I mean, we are in an era where we are working remote. Um, the demand for buildings is is and has changed. And as you look at organizations that are going to be embracing remote working that much longer, the purpose of our buildings is once again going to change. And the idea of having um, a, a, a better um, experience in the corporate environment and that what that means, if you're looking at high performance buildings, it is about my personal as an occupier, my cognitive performance, and having the information to, um, you know, for the immediate, you know, health and safety, right? The occupancy levels, understanding, you know, who's there, where folks are, being able to book and, and reserve, but also once I'm there, being able to understand that the ambient conditions are conducive to deep knowledge work is going to be critically important, I believe, as, as we move forward. And the technology exists. It's a matter of, of weaving it together and making those data streams accessible and tangible. Um, in, in a way that both occupiers and building owners and managers um, can can leverage effectively. That was a great example, and I want all our viewers to hear. We spend ninety percent of our time in buildings, and buildings health has a direct impact on cognitive health of us. If we can leverage technology, as Kelly was saying, bring those insights to affect and keep the building's health all the time at a healthy level we can have a direct impact on our cognitive health, as well as the decisions we make uh, for our companies, our clients, and our customers. So technology exists, we can make use of that, and we can bring those insights and take actions. Maybe just changing uh, uh, gear, uh, Stuart, coming to you. Uh, you know, while we are talking uh, around safe and healthy environment for people, but we also need to take care of safe and healthy buildings for our environment itself in terms of net zero buildings, sustainable buildings. What do you see in that space? How are you, you know, delivering those needs for your clients and customers? Well, right. well that's an interesting question, Manish. And you're right, uh, people with then goals um, still remain. Um, so beyond the short-term challenges posed by pandemic readiness, the um, long-term vision should be to take on future challenges like the climate crisis, through deeper sustainability and resiliency. So energy efficiency is a key part of having a sustainable low cost net um, zero journey. We're now seeing that businesses and buildings have to be more dynamic and a need to react to the um, ever changing real world environments that we're now living in. So the current COVID ventilation guidance further highlights that the majority of buildings are designed to a performance spec which is then often value engineered at construction phase. This then leads to inadequate control of their environment as there's little or no quality measurement within the workspace. So potentially there's a trade off between energy costs and higher quality air. However, using the right sensors and reporting tool presents a significant opportunity to use data to demonstrate an optimal indoor air environment while improving energy efficiency. So I'll um, just briefly share, uh, you know, a real life customer story. So, so we support um, University College London. So UCL is in the heart of Bloomsbury in London and is a uh, leading multidisciplinary university. So we support across campus over 230 buildings, uh, which, you know, houses more than 13,000 staff and 42,000 students. So, um, so UCL normally presents many challenges um, in the fact that it's not only a teaching facility, it's also uh, one of the world's top research institutes. 
So since the emergence of COVID disease uh, way back in December 2019, UCL's efforts have been focused on applying their depth and breadth for the world's leading research expertise to help humanity recover from this global crisis. So during lockdown, we had to maintain our campus with a mixture of remote working as we're able to monitor and control building with re um, remote BMS connectivity and where necessary shift pattern changes had to happen to keep us and our engineers safe and out of harm's way for the important work being carried out um, uh, UCL. So um, in in the next few weeks, UCL will be ready to welcome its students to start the new term. Um, and 2021 um, academic year is necessar necessarily going to look and feel different from previous years as students learn to adapt to living, working and studying through the global COVID uh, pandemic. So in term one, new students will be returning with the option of studying on campus or wherever they're based around the world. As the situation is constantly evolving, UCL needs to ensure their buildings are dynamic to meet the new needs of students and academics to ensure it's as safe as possible with no impact on studies. However, UCL still has a commitment to net carbon zero by 2024, so that's not gone away, which um, also includes a reduction of energy consumption by 40%. So this was a challenging commitment in the outset, but it's now more challenging in the new normal. To meet this requirement, we will need to deploy more intelligent IoT devices to gather greater data to help us optimise our buildings efficiently. Thank you, Stuart. That's a fascinating example of a university. Uh, and I see that universities around the world are taking a lead in meeting some of the net zero and carbon goals uh, by deploying more technology and being at the forefront of it. Uh, you know, changing just a, a, another topic, we also see buildings are complex ecosystem, many subsystems, and, uh, you know, a lot of players in the value chain. Mike, maybe, you know, uh, turning to you, uh, Action Art Electric, we believe that, you know, no one can innovate alone and can change the fundamentals or, or the direction in which we want to go. We need to collaborate, partner together to make shifting, creating step change in healthier buildings, sustainable building. How do you see the role of uh, ecosystem partnership or ecosystem so that we can collectively uh, move some of these big rocks that are in front of us, you know? Yeah, sure, Manish. So, I mean, it's a big market, you know, buildings, there's a lot of them. And there's, you know, when we look at this journey ahead around net zero for buildings, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of not just the quantity of buildings, but also the amount of technology that's going to have to be mastered uh, to do that. So, you know, at Schneider Electric, we, we believe in, in partnership because we cannot do everything. And we set up a number of years ago now what we call our eco-expert partners that we're very pleased to work together with. And I hope some of them are online today. And what we, what we look for are, are companies that are as passionate as we are about this topic around efficient, sustainable, healthy buildings uh, and have dedicated their companies to mastering the technologies and the processes that are required to deliver that. Um, so we run, we run a program called Eco Experts. So what that's doing is, is giving credit to companies, identifying partners that we work with where we think they have a specialization in things like management, uh, building management systems or security door access systems or lighting control systems or critical power or even as a master system integrator for, for a building. Uh, secondly, we also look for people who are working in particular sectors that have a particular expertise around the sector, something like healthcare, for example, hotels or commercial real estate. So partnering is really part of the solution here. We see ourselves as Schneider Electric is very much being a technology provider. And as I was talking about earlier, we, we understand how to deploy this technology. We do it in our own buildings, but we certainly want to work with partners as we see this is a very, very large uh, market. So it gives us additional breadth and coverage in the market. <clears throat> now, the second area that, that we collaborate very much on, again, back in the vein of saying not everybody can do it themselves, is with the major, um, the major technology players. 
So, for example, we have uh, alliances with Microsoft and Cisco, who are also very active in this space uh, around the whole digital backbone and cloud services for, for buildings. Uh, and we also work at an operational level on the application level with, with companies like Somfy and NASA Aboy, uh, where we are trying to develop a connectivity together that makes it easy to connect everything together. And we, we work globally with companies like Hilton and Marriott, et cetera, so that can be easily deployed. So we have a partnership of experts who can deliver solutions. We are a technology partner and a technology provider ourselves. And all of this is coming together into what we call our ecostructure platform for buildings, uh, which is an architecture where you can be clear when it's put together, it's going to deliver what you need in terms of a digital backbone. Now, the last piece managed that, again, is quite new for us, we opened it up now about a year ago, uh, is we, we saw this situation where we have a lot of partners, technology partners, operational partners, uh, eco-expert partners, and we were trying to figure out how can we facilitate collaboration between all these partners. So we launched what was called our Schneider Exchange platform. Now, the Schneider Exchange platform is all around how do we foster an open collaborative ecosystem uh, to accelerate this transformation in buildings. And the idea is very simple. You can go on there, you can register your company on there, you can talk about what your expertise is. Some people then use it for saying, I've developed an application for this particular function in the building. Is there anybody else that would like to use that, to purchase that, et cetera? So it's an open platform. It's, it's hosted by Schneider, but the goal is to connect together all of these players in the buildings world so that we can really accelerate the rate at which we are able to make uh, smart buildings. So it's becoming very popular. We, we're very pleased to see a lot of our partners on there connecting with each other and understanding how they can complement each other and, of course, complement Schneider. Uh, but as I say, it's hosted by us, but it's an open platform. Uh, and make sure to stay with us at the end because there's going to be a short demo of that uh, platform at the end. So it's technology and partnership to give breath in the market so that we can all go faster on this journey. Uh, th thank you, Mike. Uh, it's, it's fascinating uh, uh, if a platform like that exchange, you know, can bring people together and really help them collaborate. A and I'm going to go to Stuart. Stuart, you are one of our eco-experts in the UK. Uh, for our viewers, eco-expert is our a partner program of system integrator who are agile entrepreneur and we collaborate with them to to deliver a new generation of building Stuart personally from your experience how have you been benefited or how you see uh, a, a, a you know a collaboration platform like exchange or being a part of an ecosystem can help a company like Kendra deliver on the new expectations of your customers Well, firstly, um, yeah, I'll talk about what it's like to be um, part of the Eco Expert program. So, so um, Kendra is a rapidly growing medium-sized enterprise. The Schneider Eco Expert program supports our business at every angle, with the strength behind a global brand, which is, you know, massive to us. Um, so it helps us improve our core competency skills by providing an excellent training program and and the great training facilities um, that they have in Ashby de la Zouz. Um, so this is not only important for our experienced engineers to further develop their skills um, and so they don't get any skill fade with new technologies. It also enables us to employ apprentices, which are you know massively important to a, a, an industry um, such as ours. And um, it you know can therefore build to replace the aging population of engineers as they retire. So an important part of being an eco-expert is the networking opportunities it allows us. There is a lot of value in connecting with our eco-expert peers for best practices and innovation and ideas on projects and new technologies that you know, other people share. So as well as the benefits to us as an expert, it means customers have an open route to market to choose with confidence a partner that is fully trained and certified by Schneider who ensures best in class um, technologies and solutions. So also being a Schneider Eco Expert provides us access to a broad portfolio of their products with the support and technical expertise and, and being that part of a larger community. So picking up on what, what Mike um, was 
mentioning about the Schneider Electric Exchange. This is such a great resource um, of information to us. Um, so, you know, te no, technology is moving faster than ever before. So we're able to share best practices, look for support from the community with our own project, and it provides an innovative idea sharing portal for us and our engineers to work on. So there's great resource materials such as white papers and thought leadership pieces that are relative to market segments, uh, which is a massive help to a, a, you know, a company like us. So, um, you know, pr prior to this, really, I didn't realise that the Schneider Electric Exchange is also open to third parties. It's not just reserved for um, in-house Schneider employees and, and third parties. And um, so anyone can join and you don't have to be a Schneider Electric partner. And I would um, definitely encourage listeners to register and gain the benefits we're getting here, Manish. Thank you, Stuart, and, and I want to emphasize again, the platform is open, what Mike said earlier. Our idea is to foster collaboration, build a strong community among different uh, players in the building industry so we can really, uh, uh, you know, as a team or as a, as a community, uh, are in better position to tackle some of the big challenges uh, in front of us. Kelly, uh, coming to you, what's your one key takeaway that you want to share, you want to leave with viewers? Uh, how do you see the evolution. So I'll let you summarize that. Sure. Thank you. I, I love being able to end by thinking and talking about the future. So, so some of the elements that we touched on already in terms of uh, integrated sensor networks and, and connected buildings, again, not a new concept, but not as, um, as widely um, deployed as, as it could or should be. And one of the comments that I made earlier was um, making a lot of that information accessible to the occupiers so that they can make choices um, around the best location or the best in environment um, to, to achieve their, their work. Now, admittedly, there's some concerns with doing that. There's um, data privacy concerns. There are um, concerns around whether or not the, the building um, management can kind of keep up with the request, et cetera. But when, when I think about, you know, your question, kind of what the future holds, is we are already at a point where personal and or consumer technology is beginning to surpass um, other environments, right? And so, you know, as, where, as biometrics and wearables become more and more sophisticated, then I believe it's only a matter of time before we can expect occupiers to have real-time information about the ambient conditions. I mean, we're already at a point where my wearable already tells me, and these are, these are legitimate elements that we at AECOM have tested and, and deployed, our wearables already tell us my hydration levels, how well I've slept, how, um, the, um, in some cases, we, we experimented with the upright sensors, literally our, our posture. So it's already tracking all of these elements about my personal performance and, and my, um, my actions in immediate um, environment. I truly believe it's only a matter of time before these wearables will already or automatically be gauging how much CO2 is in the air and or VOCs and or light levels. And so it's a matter of um, not only being aware that this is happening, but preparing for it as as a building as a building community, building owners, managers, landlords, et cetera, have to be prepared that that demand is only going to continue to increase. That that information is going to become available, um, whether planned or not. So so the ask is 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 to embrace this technology, recognize uh, its importance because again it, it's coming. And and I also you know coming back to the dialogue around the the benefit of the the exchange is if, if you haven't been able to tell from my, my commentary and or you know, the, the, my, my opinions, is our work, the Strategy Plus work, the, the studio that I lead within ACOM has always been focused on occupier performance, occupier behavior, and just improving the worker experience um, on a number of different levels. And so you know, as we talk about this technological evolution, if you will, as we see the, the, the technology maturing, the awareness enhancing, we really do need to come together as um, cross-disciplinary individuals within an industry. Um, you know, as Manish mentioned, I mean, and, and you know, partnering with, with Schneider and being able to leverage the technical expertise 
the technology expertise has been critical um, in, in us talking to our clients and helping them understand and prepare for that future. So, so the benefits are vast and, and has brought us together, has allowed this exchange, has allowed this forum, has allowed us to really work with them as they developed this, this software um, that also works you know, seamlessly with hardware to really be able to make that information accessible. Uh, and it's something that we're able to bring forward to our clients and, and talk about um, with confidence because we we were involved in its development. We've you know been um, been able to benefit from this exchange and, and working with others and, and bringing new ideas to the table. So um, I realize we only have a few moments left, but I again the future biometrics. That's that's my final statement. I completely agree, Kelly, with you, and I loved your uh, parallel with biometric for humans uh, and, and, you know, uh, variables. I think we need to expect the same from health of buildings as well. So uh, I, I think it's, it's a very good summary. Uh, uh, everyone, you should be able to see a QR code on your screen. Uh, please use your smartphone, and it should be able to take you to Schneider Exchange, so you can visit Schneider Exchange. And I think it's also a perfect time to start with questions. Uh, from our chat. Uh, moderator? All right, so the first question is coming, Mike, for you. Uh, and the question is from Javier Ferroringing. Hopefully I'm pronouncing the last name correctly, apologize. Uh, the question is, how can we make our electrical loads more intelligent, you know, and what we can learn from that? Yeah. So great, great question. And, um, you know, that, that's absolutely part of the scope that we work on, Javier. Um, you know, when I talk about smart building and our eco, eco structure architecture, uh, it's, it's not just talking about the building management system. It's also incorporating the electrical load, the security, the access systems, etc. Uh, so the electrical load is a key part of any building uh, to know what's happening there, to know what the resilience is, to know what your current draw is, et cetera, uh, is hugely important. And that is all something that's readily available on the market today, uh, certainly from Schneider Electric in terms of um, things like Power Advisor, for example, that we incorporate into that architecture. I think what, what, what we're promoting here today is not just the concept of using, let's say, the, the building management system itself. It's about the really fully integrated building from the connectivity and the power right through to as I say, that one pane of glass that can tell you who's, which desks are being occupied, et cetera. That's the truly connected, integrated building. Fully agree, Mike. Uh, and and uh, I think the vision uh, uh, all of us should have is a complete health of the building, uh, everything around space, healthiness, as well as electrical load, all the critical infrastructure as well, uh, so that we can create sustainable, healthy, and resilient building at the same time, because some of this infrastructure powers the building and keeps the building alive. Uh, second, uh, I have another question uh, coming from Abhishek. Can it for you? Uh, how do you incorporate the new employee interaction norms uh, while creating new office spaces? So I guess the question is a little bit on the background of COVID-19. How do you ensure the interaction? You know? So um, obviously, you know, we we talked through throughout this the past hour about how the demand is changing and how the expectations are are changing. There's um, to 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 simplify it to simplify a very complex topic. We've really we bucketed um, all of the the criteria or all the the considerations, if you will, into three primary categories. There's the operational, the behavioral, and the spatial. And so, you know, in the operational, there is everything from your disinfection um, procurement and protocols and, and training, et cetera, to make sure that, that everything that, that needs to be done or that can be done has been, you know, when you, the, the, the other two, the kind of spatial and behavioral, obviously very much interplay with one another. And um, in the interest of time, well, with, with a few moments left, I'd, I'd be happy to share, we have a lot of materials that um, explain this more in depth, but there's an element of ensuring uh, that the, the occupier behaviors are clear and understood. 
Um, and obviously some of the new standards coming out, you have to adhere to physical distancing, you know, thinking about kind of zoning and, and the, the sizing of certain elements. Um, but again, making sure that it's very clear that what the behavioral expectations are, um, are known so that people use the space in, in a way that is pragmatic, healthy, and, and, and safe. And the, dig and the digitization between the two can help make that that much more seamless. And whether it's an app that basically shares occupancy levels and or how many people, um, utilization levels, et cetera. Again, it's about making information available so that people can adhere to whatever protocols have been put in place. Kelly, that's a great segue to the question I see on the chat from Enrique, actually it's to me. Uh, the question is, do you see a world where every building is going to have a mobile application that connects its occupant to the building services? And, and I want to answer, Rike, we definitely see that paradigm coming to buildings. You know, it's been uh, historically, all of the technology that is in building or information is not as readily available. But I think there are no barriers today that exist that we cannot put buildings in the hands and palms uh, of uh, occupants. You know, as an occupant, uh, at my home, I have every all the systems of my uh, home on my mobile phone, and I see that expectations are going to be the same for building. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, if you visit Schneider Electric uh, website, we have launched uh, late last year an application called EcoStructure Engage that hopes to connect all the services for occupants on a single mobile app, so that you know you can have access to your comfort system, you can have access to your uh, elevator, you can have access to the queue in the cafeteria, and so on and so forth. So definitely we see a world where buildings are going to be in the hands and on mobile phone for occupants. Uh, I think one, one of the other question I see on the chat, so it's probably for you from Mega. Uh, she's saying, as we are deploying more IoT for air quality, do you see that a simply increase in the cost of these systems? So how do you we tackle uh, increasing Cost, you know, what do you think your client's uh, answer is going to be, or what's your, uh, you know, uh, uh, pitch to your customers? Um, well, traditionally, yes. Um, however, with um, tech developments, uh, with wireless technology, product costs are lowering. I mean, previously you would have had to, you know, wire these; they're, they're expensive. Um, however, now with the wireless technology, there's no need for. Um, time-consuming, expensive installations or ripping up walls and ceiling tiles. I mean, the latest indoor quality air sensors can be up and running in hours. Um, and now with the improvement in battery life, you know, the battery life is quite extensive, up to five years with some of these devices. And um, so you can either deploy these, as I mentioned previously, as Zigbee or a Notion to a local room controller, or if you've got an IoT device that is pumped up to the cloud, I mean, you can now um, use APIs straight into your BMS um, to report and use the data they gather. It's as easy, as simple as possible nowadays. Yeah. Fully agree, Stuart. I think definitely there is a little bit of cost in the benefit outweighs that cost. And also some of the wireless technology is also decreasing the cost of these uh, sensors. So I fully agree with you. Uh, just looking at the time, I think it's time to conclude. I just want to summarize my personal takeaways uh, from the session is buildings can make a huge impact to our personal life, our well-being, but also it has a huge impact to the well-being of our mother planet. So uh, we need all of us to embark on digital technologies to help us tackle the needs and challenges, whether it's healthier building, well-being of people, uh, occupant services, uh, uh, you know, on the mobile phone, all creating a much more sustainable and resilient infrastructure. Uh, and I also uh, uh, want to highlight the point that Mike and all of us made is we cannot uh, take these challenges as a one company. We need to come together in the form of collaboration, ecosystem, uh, and partnership so that we can address uh, collectively uh, these challenges. Uh, Finally, uh, uh, we will pause here, and uh, in a few weeks, I want to say that we will come to another important topic uh, uh, called cybersecurity. So we will discuss that topic as well, which is very much linked to the technology. And, and uh, before you leave, just stick around for a few more uh, 
uh, minutes to watch the demo of Shard Electric Exchange. Uh, and I want to say thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. Stay safe and take care. Thank you very much.